The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Our next speaker is Bob Kirshner, who is currently the uh, Chloe's Professor of Science at that uh, community college in Massachusetts. I guess because it's a community college, they don't have physics and astronomy, they just have science. Um, he, his real claim to fame is that he's a Caltech alum. He was a, got a PhD. <laughs> Uh, here, working with Bev Oak in 1975, and because he did such a great thesis, he became a distinguished alumni here and got that prize a few years ago. Uh, he also has a book for sale. If you have it, he'll autograph it. <laughs> if not, he'll sell it to you. Uh, he's he's going to tell us about uh, telescopes past, present, and future. Bob. Thank you. Well, I, I did wonder a little bit why people invited me here, because after all, I'm not a big user of the Keck telescope. But I think the real answer is people are looking for validation from the outside. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> turns out at Harvard, we also have been involved in uh, building the world's largest telescope. Uh, and I'd like to show that to you now. This was uh, one of the world's largest telescopes. <laughs> In 1843, it turns out there was a great comet in 1842. The people of Boston came to the college and said, where can we see the comet? And uh, the, at the observatory, well, at, we didn't really have one. They uh, said, we don't really have one. Uh, and the uh, citizens of Boston got together and in 60 days raised enough money to build the largest telescope in the world, uh, shown here. Uh, and the, and just to show you that we don't forget the donors, this plaque has their names <laughs> on it. And we invented some or introduced some new technology, too. Uh, here's the daguerreotype, uh, which it was uh, this is one of the first images uh, uh, made with a way of recording the light in a permanent form, which really changed the way astronomy was done. Uh, the detectors, of course, were very inefficient. You know that those old photographs from the Civil War required people to sit very still for quite a long time while the exposure was being conducted. And in a way, the story of astronomy, at least using detectors, is the story of improving the efficiency of these, uh, these ways of, of measuring light, as I'll show you in a second. And that has a very important consequence for how telescopes have developed over time. Here's a uh, diagram uh, of that shows the size of telescopes. This is a logarithmic plot of the size of telescopes. And here's time going over here, starting with Galileo's telescope. And here's the Keck telescope up here. And here's the great refractor. And what you can see is there's a, you can draw a line through these points. It doesn't really mean anything, but it says every century, every century, the telescopes get 10 times bigger. Of course, that's sort of in the passive voice. You know, it doesn't just happen. You have to work like crazy to make this happen. But nevertheless, uh, it's true. And if you think about it, you can even look at this and see who's ahead of their time and who is behind a little bit. So here's Herschel, definitely ahead of his time, because he's sort of to the left side of the line. The Great Refractor, well, we're a very conservative organization. We like to, <laughs> like to make sure we're using a good technique. And then if you look down here, the 100-inch telescope, the Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson, of course, is one of the great telescopes that put the Carnegie Institution on the map, and that's you know, only a few miles away from here, including some of them up. Uh, and it, this telescope really was one of the great uh, breakthroughs in telescope uh, technology. It was one of the big reflecting telescopes, uh, like all the telescopes that uh, we've been discussing today. And again, the technology for that, at least at the beginning, was the technology of photography. So you know, it, there was uh, there's glass, there's gelatin made out of the hooves of animals, there's uh, silver nitrate uh, 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 somewhere, uh, uh, silver halides put in there, uh, silver salts in the, in the gelatin. And then when the light comes in, you know, you do some complicated chemical thing uh, and you reduce it to make uh, the image. This is a particularly important image. This is with the 100-inch telescope. 
It was the picture that Edwin Hubble used to find the first Cepheid variable in M31, the nearby galaxy, and by measuring the brightness of that star, he was able to show that these things were outside the Milky Way, that the galaxies are separate objects, not part of the Milky Way. Uh, and it was a tremendous uh, change in our view of the whole way the universe was organized, leading, of course, to Richard Ellis's work. <laughs> <laughs> And then let's just go up here, a imp very important telescope to Caltech uh, is the Hale Telescope, the 200-inch telescope at five meters, built in the middle of the 20th century, uh, right on the line, you notice. Of course, it was delayed a little bit by uh, World War II, <laughs> where they decided they had other things to build out of steel for a while. Uh, and the telescope, the 200-inch is a, a tremendous innovation in telescope building that has echoes in some of the telescopes of the present day. This is a picture of the 200-inch mirror, uh, which of course is a piece of glass, the front of which is polished and aluminum deposited on the front. And here are two jokers looking from the back uh, at the telescope. And what you can see is that a lot of the telescope is not there. A lot of the mirror is not there. A lot of the glass uh, is not present. It's a honeycomb kind of structure in which the mirror was lightweighted a lot by putting in a solid mold when they cast the glass. And we'll come back to that theme uh, when I talk about the present generation of telescopes. The other thing you can see here, and this will be a constant, or at least a constant variable, uh, almost all the pictures have a human being in them, and we have to get the right size person for each uh, <laughs> telescope in each age. It's not true that every century people get ten times as big. <laughs> so here's this picture which we, we saw before at the beginning, and which is uh, over on the side of the auditorium, the 200-inch which is really an emblematic telescope, but also one which has been very important to Caltech and which illustrates, I think, uh, this uh, point I wanted to make about the detectors and the reason why it was important to build a bigger telescope uh, in the 1980s. What was the reason why the 200-inch telescope lasted so long and what was, the re what was it that ran out uh, in the 1980s that really demanded a bigger telescope in order to make progress. Uh, oh, sorry, and the 200-inch, of course, has uh, uh, achieved a kind of uh, iconographic uh, quality shown here as a modern miracle. Great advances for science, 200-inch telescope to reach hidden depths of space, great advance for you, Bond's homogenizing process for this uh, white bread. <laughs> okay, so why was the 200-inch so durable? After all, it started out when postage was only three cents. <laughs> and again, it's this technology for detection. Here I show you uh, a photograph of uh, Charlie Kowal holding a glass plate. This was a big kind of glass plates that we used at the Palomar Schmidt uh, until fairly recently. And it was sort of the apex of the photographic uh, technology. And that was continued on up uh, into the 70s and even into the 80s. And the thing that changed was the technology for measuring light. Instead of using a chemical process where the light comes in and activates that uh, silver halide, uh, of course what we do now is use silicon detectors where the light comes directly into the material of the semiconductor and puts electrons into a state where we can measure the electric charge that's produced by these detectors. You know all about this, really, the detector in your uh, um, a digital camera or in your cell phone is of this general type, and you know that they're much more sensitive to light than the old uh, film cameras. You don't need to use the flash very much. Uh, and here is something sort of at the dawn of time. This is Bev Oak, who was my thesis advisor, and he's very happy to have in his hand the world's largest uh, uh, CCD detector, silicon detector, at 0.24 megapixels. Well, okay. This is just a little acorn, <laughs> but uh, the point is that uh, the technology for uh, silicon detection is a hundred times better. So the light is detected a hundred times more efficiently by a solid state detector than by photography. And what that meant for the 200 inch was that during those decades, while the telescope was really at its apex, the, it got a hundred times better because the detectors went from being photographic detectors to being these silicon detectors. So 
That's why the, the 200-inch telescope, just because of the particular moment in time, uh, lasted, I think, for such a long time. These are nearly 100% efficient. You can't do better than that. I mean, you could vote twice, but really, you cannot really do better than perfect detection. And when the detector, this one, of course, is quite small. I'll show you one in a second that's bigger. Uh, once the silicon detectors grew up to have areas that were comparable to what the old photographic plates had been, then the only way forward was not from improving the efficiency, but from building a bigger telescope and measuring light. And that, I think, is the technological and sort of historical reason why the Keck telescope became such a uh, clear need uh, in the middle of the 1980s as this technology uh, changed. The other thing I want to say is that uh, the, the present is actually a little richer uh, than we've talked about here. That, uh, oh, so, so first of all, I want to say that the detectors got big. So here's uh, John Tonry looking at uh, a silicon detector where this whole black thing is an array of uh, these CCD devices. And it's big, as big as the photographic plates uh, of the earlier area. So that shows that this revolution has really uh, taken place. So let's look at the Keck, which is up here. Notice it's a little uh, on the upside of the line, well, compared to these other things. You know, it was a pioneer. It was early uh, and very effective at the large scale of telescopes. Um, and uh, if you look into the Keck telescope, of course, there is a geometric idea, which is very important, and which is a combination, which has uh, been reproduced in many of the other uh, designs, too. And that is the idea of the hexagon. As you know, you can pack hexagons right uh, next to one another. Uh, and the image of the mirror of the Keck telescope uh, conveys that sort of elementary geometric uh, fact. So as do bathroom tiles. Uh, so here you see the Keck uh, primary mirror, and again, with a human being put in uh, for scale. And you can see that it's made of these hexagons, which are made very close to one another, but not quite touching. And of course, one of the great uh, technical breakthroughs in the Keck was to uh, measure carefully uh, the positions of the individual segments and control that uh, from the back to make a single a mirror surface. The hexagon uh, theme is echoed beautifully in the windows at the Waimea headquarters uh, here for the Keck Observatory, uh, where, the observa where the observers often go uh, to uh, do their work, so they don't often go to the summit now. And I wanted to just read a little something from my favorite book. And this is on the subject, this is on the subject of measuring distant supernovae to try to sketch out the history of cosmic expansion. This has turned out to be a very interesting subject. Uh, and it describes a little bit of uh, uh, being at the Keck Observatory. Uh, the beautiful picture that I showed you a minute ago is a kind of architectural thing, lovely uh, site. But across the street there is a, par there is a shopping center, uh, which plays a role in this. <coughs> All right. So this is about uh, Alex Filipenko, who also uh, did his PhD uh, at Caltech and who was involved in all of this. And it was about us trying to find the distant supernovae and then Alex was going to measure them with the Keck. While we try to provide a few days between the search and follow-up, sometimes that margin gets eaten up by glitches in the data processing. Then the sickening possibility of wasted time on the largest telescope in the world begins to gnaw at the observers. Alex Filipenko could be at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii waiting with the suppressed tension of a drag racer at a red light while Peter Chalice is slaving away in Chile sorting reality from illusion, finding the supernova. On a calm day, Alex is a bundle of nervous energy. This relentless attention has served him well. Alex has become one of the most productive astronomers in the world. Slender, intense, and focused, he has the fast twitch muscles of the star tennis player he is and the eating habits of a fast food junkie. <laughs> On the afternoon of an observing run, Alex snarfs cheese doodles while his bouncing leg communicates his anxiety. Has Pete put the targets at the team website? Not yet. And then there's a footnote, which I, you know, 
Not yet, it's the polite form of no in Chile. That's all I want to say. <laughs> when twilight begins in Hawaii, now we're getting there. When twilight begins in I wanted a sentence like that. When twilight begins in Hawaii, Alex walks across the Keck parking lot to the nearby McDonald's and buys a bag of Big Macs. If the tar targets are still not poised, posted, his ten the tension is contagious. Alex becomes like Sherlock Holmes without a case. In The Adventure of the Wisteria Lodge, Sherlock says, my mind is like a racing engine, tearing itself to pieces because it is not connected up to the work for which it was built. <laughs> but once Brian Schmidt <laughs> and Peter Garnovich get the observing list in order, the Keck Dome is open and it's time to go to work. Alex is the best guy to have in the pilot's seat because he focuses all that energy on the task at hand. Paying attention doesn't make the photons come in faster, but it helps you anticipate what to do next and to avoid wasting precious telescope time. Later in the night, Alex refuels with hamburgers. <laughs> Without regard for their temperature, freshness, or the texture of the congealed cheese, and washes them down with strawberry soda. <laughs> While others' attention drifts, Alex never flags, squeezing every minute of data from a night at the mighty Keck. <laughs> it goes on. But I've misrepresented myself a little bit. I, I said at the beginning I come as an outsider, but that's not true anymore. I received a night of telescope time <laughs> <laughs> through the NASA allocation, and I'm going to go between Alex and Shri. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, I just wanted to say a word about other telescopes, uh, not too much, I hope. Uh, and that is to say, at that moment in the 80s, uh, as Ed Stone mentioned briefly at the beginning of this afternoon, there were different paths that people were considering to make large telescopes. And they were the Keck approach, which seemed nutty to make many small hexagons, the approach that was eventually followed for the Gemini telescopes that uh, Richard uh, was involved with, where uh, a single thin sheet of glass is used as the mirror. And there was another uh, technique that was um, uh, being evolved, which is the one that was used first at the MMT and then later at Magellan, to have a mirror that has a thin sheet of glass on the front, but a kind of much thicker honeycomb structure, lightweighted structure, like the one that I showed you for the 200 inch uh, on the back. And what's interesting is that all three of these have succeeded, that the Keck has been a success, the Gemini mirror has been a success, and the Magellan and MMT telescopes have all worked. So there were three solutions uh, to this problem. So I just show you briefly uh, the Keck telescope, which had one thin mirror, but the price that you pay for that is that you must support it very, very actively and with a very stiff and complicated support. Here's the mirror. Here's uh, the usual person. Only upside. That's the upside down image of the. This here's where it's the person. Oh, maybe it's in upside down. Anyway, uh, there's the thin mirror, and here's the very complicated support. This is actually one for the VLT, the European telescope, but it's the same idea. There is a way to do it. You have to put your energy into a different uh, aspect of the problem. Uh, so that's, yeah, so that's, uh, okay, so here's Magellan. Uh, and again, here you can see that there's a big mirror in there, six and a half meters across. This is a mirror that has this honeycomb structure. It turns out that uh, bees are uh, very good engineers in a way that they use a very minimal amount of material to get a stiff structure that has the volume. It's also very good for uh, larvae uh, to be in. We don't use that aspect of it in the mirrors. <laughs> um, but you can see that the geometry of it is that the material of the honeycomb is very small, whereas the thickness is quite big. And that helps give the mechanical structure, the mirror, the stiffness that it needs to keep from bending. So uh, that here's, you can see there's quite a lot of thickness to this. This is the MMT mirror at the most heart-wrenching moment when <laughs> you pick it up and put it into the building. Uh, and you can see that it has a lot of depth to it. Okay, and so people have recognized these three different routes and really the genius of the different people uh, who've been involved in this. So here is uh, a, a happy moment in 2010 where the Cobley Prize was being awarded to Jerry Nelson uh, to Roger Angel, who uh, worked on these honeycomb mirrors, and to Ray Wilson, who worked on these uh, stiff support kind of mirrors, for their contributions to the, to the development of giant telescopes. 
So this leads to the next question, what about the future? And I think there are still options for different ways to go into the future that echo a little bit the successes that people have had in the 1990s. So people are hoping to build yet bigger telescopes. The TMT, the 30-meter telescope that Caltech is involved in, the GMT, which is the telescope that Harvard's involved in. You notice once again, Caltech a little to the left of the line, <laughs> ahead of things, more daring, perhaps so. Uh, and so I show you here an image, an artist's image, somehow they've gotten rid of the dome, of the, uh, <laughs> of the 30 meter telescope. Uh, and uh, not only that, they've totally lost control of the observatory. Now they let the people observe in the daytime. It looks like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and you can't see it very well because the individual segments are about the same size as they were for the original Keck telescope. This telescope is three times bigger, 30 meters instead of 10 meters across. But what you can see, if you look carefully, is that there is a hexagon kind of structure underneath it, that each of those is a hexagonal piece taking advantage of this simple geometrical fact that you can put those things uh, edge to edge and fill the space. And here's another image of what the 30 meter telescope is going to be. Those mirrors don't do it by themselves, you need a very cleverly done structure behind, you need very careful support and very active uh, measurement of the entire mirror shape. And it's a good thing to see that since they have so many of these hexagons to make, close to a thousand, uh, that they've made one. And so here are, it's a, here's a mirror uh, that is uh, uh, being um, prepared as a test mirror for uh, the 30 meter telescope. But let me just say, as in the 80s, I think that their other technologies may also succeed. That will be interesting. Uh, here's a telescope that we're trying to build where you can see there are a lot fewer segments. Uh, these are eight meters across. We got the small enough people to do that. <laughs> we had the same problem with opening, the op opening up in the daytime. And look, the artists put clouds in there. Observatory directors never put clouds in their <laughs> pictures. And uh, these mirrors are uh, quite large. They are, it's a segmented mirror in the same, in a way, uh, but the segments are very large, only seven of them. And then this hexagonal structure that I described before, you can see here, this is the, uh, the, t the first of the GMT mirrors, which has been cast. You can see it still has the mold in it. Those are those hexagonal segments. That's where the bees are that have to be cleaned out to make uh, a hollow. We have to get the honey out. We have, anyway, we have to. Uh, <laughs> We have to uh, uh, clean that out uh, to make the uh, hexagonal mirrors. We've polished it. Uh, we've cast the second one. And so in our own way, we're on our path uh, to achieving the same thing. I think what's so important here is that the Keck has been uh, an inspiration uh, to really to everyone. And uh, the success, the scientific success of the Keck is the thing that everyone uh, wants to uh, try to reproduce. If we're both successful, there'll be a telescope in the northern hemisphere and there'll be a telescope in the southern hemisphere that U.S. astronomers will have substantial access to, so that could be a good thing. So finally, I wanted to just say a, a word about science, because nobody builds these telescopes just because they like to do the engineering projects. Let me just say a word about these supernovae and measuring distances. Uh, Edwin Hubble uh, is known for measuring the distances to the galaxies, and I mentioned that, I showed you that plate from 1923, where he really started this subject. And he wrote a book in the 1930s about uh, his work, uh, which was mostly about the kinds of stars that uh, he used and the brightness of the galaxies. But he also, it turns out, pay attention, Richard, this is important. <laughs> he also said supernovae can be detected at immense distances. And in principle, they are a criterion of distance about as reliable as that of the total luminosities of the nebulae. In other words, he had used the brightness of the, of the galaxies, but you could have used the supernovae. The problem, he said, is actually, however, the maxima are so seldom observed and the supernovae themselves are so rare that they contribute very little to the present problem. Well, that was true in the 1920s, but this same technological revolution that I've been talking about has led to the ability to find many of these supernovae and to change this part of the equation. The Palomar transient factory that's being done here and many other uh, applications of big detectors uh, are doing that. And the measurement of the distances has led to the discovery that the expansion of the universe, which we all thought would be slowing down, is actually speeding up. Uh, and so here's a recognition of that. Uh, Saul Perlmutter, who was a Harvard undergraduate, 
uh, Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese, who were my graduate students at Harvard. <laughs> Turns out it's also possible to get some education elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> are shown here are shown here at the 2011 uh, Nobel Prize ceremony, uh, receiving the prize for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. Uh, it's Hubble who really uh, uh, characterized the process of observing uh, in this book. Uh, he was talking about um, what we need to, what we do, and you heard many examples of this uh, this afternoon. The problem for the observer, he said, was to determine the actual values of the constants, or at least to narrow the range within which they must lie. That is, the constants that we're talking about here include the cosmological constant, the dark energy, the thing that makes the universe accelerate. He wasn't talking about it at the time. He was talking about the Hubble constant, but he was too modest to say so. <laughs> and then he said, and in a sort of uh, poetic uh, coda to the book, he says, uh, we measure shadows, and we search among ghostly errors of measurement. And I think that that is still true. We're still at it, and we're looking for better tools to make these measurements. Thank you very much.